Well, it's great to participate and uh, tell you about pharmacogenomics, which is, is an integral part because it relates to drug therapy. And uh, very often, you see any new uh, developments eventually may lead to a new therapy. So um, we can use pharmacogenomics to identify new drugs, to develop them, or to treat. And so I will focus on the, on the latter. Um, so that uh, defines the topic a little bit better. I also would like to say that all the talk, the two talks from this morning about all the omics, we can use any biomarker in pharmacogenomics. Um, it doesn't have to be genetics. It can be a, a metabolite. It can be a protein. It can be an assembly of RNA molecules and so on. So I wanted to give you a, a very brief overview of what's going on in pharmacogenomics and the implementation in particular at OSU, and then in particular um, tell you about the uh, approach we're taking in our lab to uh, find new biomarkers that might be clinically relevant, and I'll give you some examples of that. Now, which one responds to this? Oh, next. That's not good. So why do we need uh, biomarkers in drug therapy? And it's very clear that um, we have most drugs, even though we had a century of drug discovery, most drugs are still have um, uh, low efficacy. Uh, maybe 50% of the people respond. 50% do not respond. We don't know who. Um, and also, we have a very high incidence of adverse drug reactions. So those are toxicities from drugs um, that are given the way they're supposed to be given. So they're thought to be unavoidable. Uh, and this was also thought to be one of the leading causes of death in the United States. So these are very important topics. And at one point, we had um, actually investigated the relationship between adverse drug reactions and uh, polymorphisms in uh, target genes. And we did find that actually those drugs that cause adverse drug reactions uh, are highly associated with metabolizing enzymes that are polymorphic. So that means that if you apply this knowledge, you might be able to reduce the adverse drug reactions, and they're not unavoidable um, as the original definition was made. I also want to point out that these uh, drug metabolizing enzymes, the genes, have frequent variants. So we're now talking about very frequent variants with very high phenotypic penetrance. They have a large effect on the drug, but they don't have any effect on the disease. And so that's one of the guiding principles that we're using uh, in our work. And we want to find frequent variants that have strong effect, um, but they're contingent upon the environment. Environment may be, um, uh, may be a, a drug effect in this case. So. Uh, to summarize, there are al already a lot of relationships known between a genetic variant and um, outcome with a drug. And in order to really appreciate that, the best source to go to is the, uh, the FDA CEDA uh, table of valid genomic biomarkers. And there you can find all the uh, classical examples that are utilized where you have a single drug and then a genetic variation, um, and it tells you uh, where, where to go to in the drug label. So those are the drug labels available to the patient, to the physician, to everybody else, as to if there's a box warning, I mean, be careful. Uh, you really should not give this. If that person has an HLA B star five, uh, 5701, uh, this patient can die from this particular drug. The best example, the classical one, is uh, this one down here in oncology, hernoi, um, which uh, indication and usage so means if you're not overexpressing hernoi, the drug will not work. So there are a lot of these examples, and what I want to point out to you is that each example is specific for the drug and the gene variant. So a gene variant does not necessarily relate even to a closely related drug. Each one of those has to be um, identified individually. And there are now a lot of uh, groups that write these reports that become available. So if these data are being put, let's say, on the EMRs, on the electronic medical records, you'll be able to then click on and go through and find out what uh, the information is and, uh, and how we can use the data. It sounds very straightforward. 
uh, but there are many questions, and so it's not an ironclad um, relationship between the genetic variant and a clinical action that you need to take in order to get a certain outcome. You know that everything is polyfactorial, and so we have to take everything with a grain of salt. So what we do, uh, we are here, uh, the group I'm leading here is part of the Pharmacogenomics Network, which interacts naturally with the CTSA groups um, and brings the pharmaco part into, uh, into focus. And part of the activity there would be the implementation. So there's a TPT, I think it's a Translational pharmaco uh, Pharmacogenomics Project, um, that uh, where we try to actually get the relevant and actionable data onto the EMR so that they can be utilized in clinical practice. And this has turned out to be a huge stumbling block. It's very difficult to process all this, um, and we need to implement um, all these steps here. There needs to be a clear proof biomarker. The data have to be available in time, store the data safely, transfer to the EMR, present flags upon prescription, etc. And that's something that is also, uh, in part, supported by the pharmacogenomics network. And we have a small portion of that, and uh, this is right now led by Peter Amby and our genetic counselors beginning to develop and, and actually have this available. This is already done in some other centers, and I think this will become probably standard practice in the future. Um, there are also other uh, activities that are already ongoing, and you may all know about the uh, driver mutations in cancer, which determine what kind of drug you might take, and these are already in clinical practice. So these, so many of these assays here are already done. You want to look for the mutation in BRAF to see whether or not verumafenib would be actually active. Uh, if you don't have this mutation, it will not be active. So uh, these are important new biomarkers. Those are companion tests, if you wish. Um, but there are many, many issues, of course, with targeted uh, therapy uh, that uh, goes after these uh, driver mutations, and it works in some cancers better than in others, and I cannot go into too much detail there. So let me then um, discuss what we're doing, because that's really where, <coughs> where my heart is and uh, what we uh, want to accomplish, because it is clear that if you look in genetic medicine, there's this term missing heritability. So we have very strong genetic effects in complex disorders. We think autism is 80%. We only know about 15% of the genetic causes. So there's this missing heritability. And where is that? And what is it? And so rather than being totally heuristic about um, the, the approach we take to find these key variants, uh, I would like to introduce some hypotheses or guiding uh, guidelines that we use to find the variants that eventually lead to biomarkers. First of all, um, there's always the idea now that probably there are less frequent variants that we need to look for, because if you have a frequent variant um, and it's associated with disease, it probably is selected against. So, but we started out looking for frequent high impact variants. So by definition, it cannot be a risk factor because it would be selected against. And in evolution, we know that the human race has evolved and there are probably many variants that are strongly, they are selectable, and they are actually frequent, but they are not associated with disease risk per se. So therefore, GWAS doesn't find them. However, contingent upon environment or gene-gene-gene interactions, they can become deleterious or can become risk factors or can determine whether you respond to drugs. So we're looking for this type of variant um, because I mentioned already evolution, it has become clear now that in evolution, uh, gene regulation is probably a main mechanism. So that maybe 80 or 90% of this type of variant would be a regulatory variant. It can regulate a transcription or mRNA processing, translation, et cetera. So we're looking for frequent variants that are regulatory in nature. And once we find those, uh, we would hypothesize that they're gene-gene interactions um, and then gene-gene environment interactions, including therapy, and that will have strong effect. So that, that's the strategy. And um, uh, we're at it now for 10 years, and I can 
I wouldn't tell this story if I didn't get at least some reinforcement, so I will tell you about what we did. Just to uh, summarize that one more time, we're looking for regulatory polymorphism that are dri uh, driven by evolution, um, and eventually they will lead to disease models even if you don't see them by GWAS because they are not risks by themselves. They are selectable in a positive way. They are high frequency for looking anything, a, a little frequency from 5 to 50 percent, and that's exactly what we have found. But there's a bottleneck. These regulatory polymers are very difficult to find because a, an enhancer region may be 100,000 base pairs upstream. And actually, uh, Dr. Nanjing Wang, who is here, um, is working on one such variant, and so we have to find these variants that are many, many, many thousands of base pairs away or in the middle of an intron or any place, um, and that has been a hurdle. So we have an, an experimental approach that I will just go through very, very briefly without uh, the details, uh, but we can discuss that later. Uh, we wanted to find, establish a way of finding all, or pretty much all, regulatory variants in key genes, and then later on a genome-wide basis, um, to, be, to be able to determine how um, they might uh, be identified and how they impact on phenotypes, in particular drug response or disease risk. So we're using this allylic expression imbalance, and I, I just want to tell you that this is a great way where you look at one allele versus the other in the mRNA in human target tissues, and you find variants uh, at a very, with a very sensitive and very reproducible way. And we have done these assays gene by gene. We may have uh, looked at about 200 genes this way, and now we're introducing uh, next generation sequencing in a big way. And Audrey Papp, who is our director of our uh, facility for this, um, has already done a lot of RNA-seqs where we can do this on a genome-wide basis. So we're beginning to establish the frequency of uh, frequent variants that we would like to investigate further. So then, we, once we have this in multiple tissues, we can use these ratios uh, in a way to find, by SNP scanning, find the gene locus, so uh, the SNP in the gene locus. So they can be very, very far away. It still would, gen it would correlate directly with the, um, w with the expression of individual alleles. And, and then something important here that I, I do emphasize is that we do enough molecular genetics, and that's a very slow step, to convince ourselves that we actually have the functional variant. Because if we just take a surrogate marker, which is typical for clinical studies, and we look, begin to look at gene-gene interactions, a surrogate marker may be only 80% accurate. And then we bring the next surrogate marker and look at a gene-gene interaction where we think the missing heritability is going to be in part accounted for. You're introducing more and more error, and eventually you're not learning. And so we will be stuck without having this type of information. So we're spending a lot of time looking at the mechanisms. And then once we have a SNP or a variant that affects the expression, the splicing, the translation, or whatever, um, and we know in which tissue that occurs, because they're all tissue specific, we can make guesses as to what the phenotype is. And that has proven uh, very successful, because we can go into existing studies and uh, begin to ask, what, uh, what outcomes do we see? What are the p-values? Uh, and how can we uh, go forward to develop this further? So um, this was kind of what we've been doing for the last 10 years, and here are some examples that we have published. Most of them have been published already. These are some of the genes where we find frequent variants, anywhere above five, as I said, up to 50 percent allele frequency. And um, what is, uh, what I just wanted to point out, that the variant locations, so where are they? There's synonymous net. There's something in the introns. There's something 10 or 15 kb upstream, uh, et cetera. It can be, it can be a non-synonymous if you change the amino acid and everybody thinks, oh, this, is, uh, uh, this changes the, the protein function. Um, but no, uh, it may well as well has the chances also to change the, um, to change the, uh, let me get this back here, uh, the expression or the turnover, uh, et cetera. So, 
we have identified these. Uh, you can see here some of the mechanisms. Um, it was a bit frustrating with GHG and HSNP had a different mechanism, so we need to do a lot of different techniques. Let me just tell you briefly about two genes. Now, they happen to be also in the cardiovascular area, which picks up very well um, in, um, with the previous talks, and then look at one gene-gene uh, interaction, but just mention that very briefly. So cytochrome P450, um, 3A4, is probably the most abundant protein uh, in the liver. And it actually it lends um, its color to the liver in part. So it's a hugely important liver, and it's um, the main drug metabolizer enzyme. It uh, metabolizes approximately 40% of all drugs. And you can see here, if you take the livers of three different individuals, the variability is huge. And there was a big debate about, is this genetic, is it environmental? I mean, clearly, it appears to be an interaction between environmental factors, enzyme induction, as well as genetic factors in the transcription factors. But nothing was known about um, the, any variant in that gene itself. And so we felt that this is one of the more important pharmacogenetic biomarkers, and therefore uh, we started working on this, and, and Dan Jing Wan has done this, and last uh, year she has published the results. And it turns out that what everybody had missed was uh, a SNP in an intron in the middle, basically in the middle of nowhere, let's say. Um, and why was it missed? It's a singleton. It exists, it sits in the main haplotype. It's not uh, in LD or not in a high LD with any other variant. And therefore, it was never initially put into GWAS because that's the, uh, a tagging approach. You use SNPs that tag haplotypes. This doesn't tag anything. It tags the main haplotype. So it was entirely missed. So this SNP, when it's there, reduces the expression of uh, mRNA two to six fold and then also has um, it, it, uh, quite a strong effect on the expression of the protein in the liver. So that's quite important. The allele frequency in this case is not all that high, but nevertheless, because there are 40% of all drugs, and you get hundreds of millions of people taking these drugs, and there's certainly quite a few that will be heterozygous, millions, millions, and hundreds of thousands will be homozygous, and that will have an effect on how we, how we respond to this. So this now is, be is becoming a biomarker. It has been assigned uh, a star 22, a star allele designation, which you have to jump through a few hurdles, and then Jing has applied for this. So we have star 22 for that. That means there are 22 alleles, and this is number 22. But I can tell you this is the only one that we know of that has that's sufficiently frequent, has an impact on uh, on this clinically. And we had done uh, a first study, and it, indeed, it decreases the dose you need for statins to reach uh, cholesterol reduction levels. So you need less, actually only half. Uh, and that was found in a rather small cohort. So there are clinical correlates. And um, since then, this was only last year that it was published. Since then, there are already several other studies coming out that show that other drugs are impacted by this variant as well, the cyclospor and tacrimus uh, in, in transplant. Uh, these are very critical drugs, and so you want to uh, titrate between toxicity and organ uh, rejection, so you have to push the dose, and this gives you some guideline, and so these are now, maybe in this area, will become important uh, uh, clinically. And also, if you look at targeted cancer chemotherapy, um, the, most of these new drugs are CYP3A4 substrates, and uh, it does make a difference if almost one in 10 will be, had, be heterozygous, and instead of giving a dose of 400, you give 600 milligrams, and that is the di distinction between being toxic, toxic or not. So in this case, um, what we also do is um, we define a CYP3A metabolizer status because there's another gene, CYP3A5, very similar to it, um, and so the two together, this is two genes that interact. Uh, we need to do both in order to understand how do those interact, which drug is substrate for one or more or the other, and so on. So all that can be sorted out uh, and maybe serve as a guideline for therapy. 
So second example is, is one that relates very much to uh, cholesterol metabolism or lipid metabolism. Uh, this is CTP, cholesterol ester transfer protein. What it does, it transfers cholesterol esters from HDL to LDL. So high activity of CTP will lead to a non, what's considered a non-favorable relationship, a high um, LDL and low HDL. So you look for low activity uh, for, H, uh, for uh, CTP, and indeed there's now a new class of drugs being introduced, CTP inhibitors, uh, two of which are, have already failed, um, which is dalcetrapib just I think last week, and then tocetrapib after a billion dollar investment um, because it didn't quite work or was toxic in other ways. We wanted to look at the um, genetics of CTP because way back then already um, there was a TAC1B polymorphism uh, published that uh, supposedly those who have the minor allele do not benefit from statins in terms of myocardial infarction. And I thought that is really a very important pharmacogenomic uh, biomarker because maybe only 50% of the people are protected. It's a hugely successful drug, but 50% are not. We want to identify who that is who is not uh, protected. And so clearly this was not a functional, this is a surrogate marker. And so we cannot rely on this because we don't know in what population it represents the pop activity. So we studied that. And to just summarize, this uh, paper came just out and Audrey Park, uh, who is in the audience also, is the senior author on that. Uh, this is our first paper on CTP. You can see it's the gene, pretty big gene. And we found uh, there were SNPs here in an enhancer region, about five to 8,000 base pairs upstream that determine uh, the expression level. And these are in a very large haplotype. The, um, the minor haplotype reduces expression. It, it looks like, because they're such large haplotypes, actually these are selected for in evolution. So there may be, but we haven't quantitated that yet. There may be selectable features to that. So if you have less activity, you would have more HDL, there may be protective, et cetera. So we now identify the functional one. The TAC1B is here in intron one. It clearly has no function we can identify. But then importantly, we found two SNPs here in uh, one in exon 9 and in intron 8 that changed the splicing. And so this protein um, is also expressed as a protein, a shortened protein that lacks exon 9. And when it lacks exon 9, it turns what was described as a um, dominant negative protein. So you make your own inhibitor in the body. And uh, so we determined that actually these SNPs here have a very strong impact on the minor allele would allow more of this to be excluded, so you make more of the, uh, of the shortened version. Um, which then uh, we could show was also highly correlated with, with HDL levels, so that both of these are highly uh, correlated. They are on opposite alleles, even though they are very, very far apart, so they, they actually, there's no uh, interrelationship with them. They are pre highly conserved uh, haplotypes. And uh, to our surprise, um, when we looked at risk for um, coronary artery disease, for instance, it became clear that um, these uh, splicing SNPs in a cohort that was already at risk um, has an odds ratio of 2.4 for, coron uh, for outcomes, coronary artery disease. So that is a, also a very large odds ratio. You have already heard about odds ratios, and typically for genetic variants, you've, you expect anything from 1.2 to 1.3, and you get very excited. So it's very high. That needs to be reproduced, but it's a warning sign, because now in those at-risk patients, if we make an internal inhibitor for CTP, it may actually be a risk factor, and you, want to, you would not want to give those subjects a, a CTP inhibitor. And so uh, we're trying to now introduce um, these variants in CTP, not only in terms of, and we're studying and actually have a very interesting data on statin uh, efficacy, but also as a tool to develop a new class of drugs like CTP inhibitors um, to show 
uh, under what conditions a CTP inhibitor might actually be favorable. And so we're trying to persuade our colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry, and there's still several companies doing that to pay attention to this, because if that is correct, it is possible that this whole class may go down just because you're treating a few patients that should not be treated where this is actually becomes a risk factor. So very briefly, um, uh, Julie Pinsonau and uh, a former student um, in a different uh, study, have, they have looked at genetic variants at the dopamine E2 receptor and the dopamine transporter. So this is now going to the CNS area um, with uh, neurological disorders, but also mood disorders and uh, mental illness and so on. And we, because we have identified now new variants um, that are frequent that regulate these, and they also have some possible signature of selection, um, they have impact, but not necessarily on disease, but the two together now. We can ask, well, how do they interact? And we looked at uh, a cocaine abuse and uh, death due to a, a cocaine abuse cohort uh, from Miami. And it turned out that the gene-gene environment interaction was extremely strong if you select the right SNPs. Typically, actually, both genes had about two or three functional genetic variants which if they're selected for, is actually makes sense because they would occur several times. And, and so you have some that are 5%, some of that are 20%, some of that are 40%. So if you pick the right combination, you all of a sudden see, you get an epistasis, a drug effect, so gene-gene environment with risk factors approaching 10. So if you have a certain combination, and, and this was just uh, submitted uh, this week, um, the statistician, a graduate student, Daniel Sullivan, uh, is the first author on that. Uh, so now you go into very high risk factors. We want to extrapolate this and now ask what type of behavior, what type of moods, what type of other therapies would be associated with these types of, of genes, and we'll bring in more genes. But if you do a gene-gene-gene interaction, three genes, it becomes even more complex. This was a very complex uh, t uh, statistical modeling approach to find the right combination and, de and identify these risk factors. So I, I uh, do want to uh, not spend too much time on this. Um, Ryan Smith in, in our lab is, is working on the serotonin to A receptor. I just wanted to bring up this is sort of an example where we now bring in the new technology of RNA-seq, and we can look at every single transcript either together or singly. And uh, it is amazing that uh, this is these reads here, these are sequence reads, they are aligned on, onto the genome browser. And when they're, where they're exons, yeah, you find uh, sequences, but you find many more. And so the repertoire of RNA species made by every single gene is much richer than we had anticipated. In this case, Ryan had identified, I think, uh, four or five different splice variants and new three prime and five prime UTRs. And he has identified two variants. Uh, the regulatory variants are very frequent uh, and could prove the, the mechanism. And now we're searching for other genes that might interact with these variants um, in any uh, serotonin-related uh, uh, mental disorder or mood disorder or whatever have you. So this is how we want to go forward on a, on a broader scale. So to summarize then, um, we, I think we've maybe relentlessly pursued the idea that there are frequent variants and does not preclude the importance of rare variants that now interact with the frequent variants, but those frequent variants, in my opinion, will determine sort of the, the clinical phenotype. And those are also the ones we're actually treating with all these boring old drugs. So we're working on boring old genes, um, and it's actually very difficult to, uh, wait a minute, go back here. It's very difficult to persuade uh, editors that this could become quite important because in other this gene has been studied. There are 500 clinical trials already out for 5-HC2A. There are 2,000 for some other genes, and we still don't know what they do. So um, we, we, uh, we, we wish to uh, determine then these regulations, look for frequent uh, variants, those that are selected for. And importantly here, then because they are not selected for being a disease risk, that doesn't make any sense. They're selected for playing some role in fitness, wellness, 
and then the transition from sickness to uh, the form from wellness to off well to disease, where they may be protected under some conditions, but not on other conditions. So conditional, that's what we're looking for. And then we find those where the environment, the drug, would uh, actually uh, have, a, that these variants have a strong impact on this. So uh, then we hopefully we find more biomarkers. And uh, so this is uh, our, our group, our, our more um, close group in, in the lab, and we have lots of collaborators at, on campus and also off campus who will work with us together. And um, I mentioned Dan Jing and Audrey and, and Ryan and uh, Danielle Sullivan. Thank you. I think we have time for one question. I'm curious <clears throat> what the impact of high throughput, high throughput sequencing has had in terms of advancing the field of pharmacogenomics. Uh, I think it's, it's very early in the game. We have started um, about two years ago, and then you have to acquire the machines. And, and so it's not a service center. It's a, it's a, um, uh, a research tool for the group and our collaborators. Um, and I think the most important part there is that it changes the culture of how you do research. You think about your specific project, but you also think much broader in, gen in genomic terms. Or if a question comes up, oh, yeah, there may be a transcription factor. Let's look at the RNA-seq data. Let's see where it's expressed. Let's see whether it has variants. And so you, you are much closer in the lab and with everybody in there, you're much closer to, on the one hand, looking at all the databases out there, looking at your own database. On the other hand, then focusing on what you think is most important. And I think this will accelerate things quite a bit. We're seeing variants uh, that we do on a genome-wide basis, but anything you do genome-wide, you, you usually are up for surprise. Um, we're going first the other way. We're asking, what can we study that makes the most sense? And these genes that are drug targets that we're analyzing by RNA-seq, as I showed for 2A, these are drug targets because they are kind of central to um, to the disease process or to the phenotype you are trying to treat, otherwise the drug wouldn't work. And those genes uh, have a much greater chance of having frequent regulatory variants in them than others. When we go through some random selected genes, we need to use 10, 20, or even 30 before we find one that has that by chance. So if you do a large screen, um, you get few things far in between. If you do a targeted approach with hypothesis behind, you may get a lot more. So the RNA-seq will help us tremendously in this, but it hasn't done much yet. What is being done um, is that uh, we, for the translation, and I think that's very important because this will come to us very quickly, uh, exome sequencing. Right now it's targeted exome sequencing. These data are being done in a clear approved way, and that's just developed, and then these data will be put into the EMRs. Uh, for or into a data house where the actual um, items will be then transferred into the EMRs and will become available. So that's next generation sequencing, and uh, I think the Genome Institute is very interested in promoting that because they want to show that genomics does something uh, at the clinical level. All right, well, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Okay.